Admittedly, I'm going to take a rather philosophical, theological approach to human freedom. I plan to look at freedom from two different perspectives, that of nominalism and that of the scriptural patristic tradition. Right now, this may not seem immediately applicable to this conference on formation. You may be rightfully hoping to hear a talk relevant to the everyday work of forming your sisters. By the completion of this talk, I think that you will be able to see that a speculative take on human freedom is pertinent to formation for at least two reasons. First, I plan to illustrate how truly influential the way that we understand our freedom conceptually affects our everyday living of the vowed life. Second, after examining the false understanding of freedom that prevails today, I think we may be surprised to find that a false understanding of freedom has had its effects on us here in this room and those we form. You may have recently seen in the news a controversy over a chair at the Department of Theology at Holy Cross in Worcester, Mass. The chair in question had written blasphemous things about our Lord in the Gospel of St. John. Even though the bishop of the diocese stepped in to ask this theologian to retract his statements, the administration at Holy Cross defended the theologian in question in the name of academic freedom. I think that none of us here would dispute that at the root of the claim that blasphemy is justified by academic freedom is a misguided concept of freedom. Nevertheless, a lot of people in the wider culture today would agree that the theologian I just mentioned was expressing his freedom. The administration at Holy Cross is conveying a sense of freedom that is rather diffuse not only among the gen general American population, but also evidently within the church, which is why I would like to address, which is what I would like to address with you today. To begin, I ask you to bear with me for a few moments while I briefly remind you about a philosophical position called nominalism. In the 14th century, a priest named William of Oakham took up a new stance regarding the natures of things. Prior to William of Ockham, the prevailing biblical patristic worldview held that since God created all things through his word, the reality we live in is imbued with the intelligible truth and goodness of God. Creation reflects the mind of God. Things in the world, especially living things, have natures, ways of being and acting proper to them as designed by God. As we all know, the study of the being of things in creation and of God himself is called metaphysics. Oakham saw metaphysics as complicated and unnecessary to understand the world in which we live. He thought that instead of things having natures, which men grasp, it was simpler to say that men project their ideas of what things are onto reality. For Oakham, God, men, and the living things around us don't really have natures. The names men call things are arbitrary, based on a decision of the human will. For example, for a nominalist, a tree doesn't have the nature of treeness. The way of being a tree is not something real and truly distinct from the way of being, say, a dolphin. Tree is just the name that men call every mass of bark and leaves. Oakham started the Western intellectual life and culture on a philosophical track that we are living out today. We are nearly entirely converted to a nominalist way of thinking. For example, we tend to view the world as mechanistic, through positivist lenses, so to speak, where only matter and physical forces 
guide the universe. We take this way of thinking for granted. It pervades our vision of reality. The real problem with nominalism is not only in how we think of trees or dolphins. Nominalism conduces to a particularly problematic understanding of God and the human person's freedom. It causes us to imagine that prior to anything else, man is free. A man is his will. We are most free when we can choose without anything hindering us. Within a nominalist mindset, freedom is being able to choose between opposite things, whether I wear red or whether I wear green, whether I wake up at dawn or whether I wake up at noon, even choosing between heaven and hell. When I cannot wake up at whatever time I want, I am unfree. The wider the scope of options that I can choose from, the freer I am. This perspective on freedom subtly assumes something about man. It assumes that a man's will comes before anything else in him, before my intellect, before anything natural to me, before any of my inclinations or passions. Within the nominalist worldview, man really has no nature aside from his freedom. I think we can all see where this leads and how it relates to our present culture. But this fundamental understanding of human freedom plays out in the moral life that we all live in two ways that on the surface might seem opposed. The one face of nominalism is easy to connect with what I have just described. It fosters a moral life where the most important value is to defend human freedom from whatever would stifle it. This could include laws, it could include traditions, it could include God himself. The subjective aspect of the person has to be exalted in a nominalist system in order to save freedom. The heavy-handed rules of God or of the church have to be passed up in favor of the individual's conscience. To defend human freedom, rulemaking needs to be handed over to the human conscience. Conscience must be defended, respected, and revered above all things. We can easily recognize this face of nominalism in the idea of freedom presupposed by the administration at Holy Cross or in various gender theories that are popular today. It is a vision of human moral life that defends freedom at all costs. It leads to extreme subjectivism and relativism. The other face of a nominalist understanding of freedom might be less recognizable to us here in this room. Olcom did not only imagine that men can be identified with their freedom. For Olcom, before God is truth or goodness, he is omnipotent. And since God is omnipotent, he is the one who gets to arbitrarily decide whether something is right or wrong. Man, being free but less powerful than God, is the one who has to follow God's laws. God's will determines the moral law because he's the most powerful thing in the universe. Man's unlimited and indeterminate freedom is limited then by the law that God has set down known by revelation, or by what I would consider a misguided concept of natural law. The only thing that keeps man moral is God's will. And if a man follows God's law, he has met his moral obligation. If he does not, he has failed in his moral duty. This face of nominalism plays out in the moral life 
as an emphasis on outward conformity to law or to legalism. The telltale marks of a legalist approach to Christian morality are a focus on sin, conscience, and law or norms. The moral life tends to work like this in this understanding of freedom. God reveals the law in the form of the Ten Commandments or statutes or laws of the church. Man learns the law, which is the role of his intellect. Now man has an informed conscience. Then a man's conscience tells his will to follow the law. A man's will, however, may or may not obey his conscience. Conscience plays the central role in moral choices within a nominalist system. Conscience is like the referee between what a man knows and what he actually does. If a man sins, he disobeys the law by disobeying his conscience. If he is good, he follows the law and his conscience. Each human act is measured as sinful or not in isolation from every other act. This is where we get casuistry from, which is the nitpicking examination of moral case studies, and this used to prevail in moral theology. In fact, this is usually what people assume I study when I say that I study moral theology. They usually say things like, better you than me, or how boring to study the rules. So a nominalist understanding of freedom has two opposite manifestations, legalism on the one hand, and subjectivism on the other hand. Now let us turn back to the recent history of religious life in the United States. In the wake of the Second Vatican Council, the renewal of religious life indisputably took on some extreme forms, including the rejection of traditional structures of authority and even serious tampering with the nature of the vows especially the vow of obedience. In many cases, religious wanted to throw off the constraints of the habit, the herarium and superiors, in favor of what they called freedom of conscience or the development of mature autonomy. They wanted to privilege personal experience over rules and traditions and to hand decision-making over to groups of religious instead of to superiors or even worse, the hierarchy of the church. It is not hard to imagine that some women religious today would likely defend the academic freedom of the theologian from Holy Cross that I just mentioned. I think it is not hard to see the connection of this kind of renewal of religious life with the nominalist understanding of freedom that I just described. But the problematic renewal of religious life that we have all lived through did not crop up spontaneously. Legalism was actually a serious problem in moral theology in the church prior to the Second Vatican Council. If legalism is well known to have been a problem in the larger church, it is not a stretch to see that it was also a problem among many women religious communities in the United States. When in 1965, blessed Pope Paul VI requested in perfecte caritatis that religious renew, he asked, and I quote, that constitutions, directories, custom books, books of prayers and ceremonies and such like be suitably re-edited and obsolete, and obsolete laws be suppressed. He also asked, and I quote, that everyone should keep in mind that the hope of renewal lies more in the faithful observance of the rules and constitutions than in multiplying laws. But even before Perfecte Caritatis, Pope Pius XII asked for renewal in religious life in the 1950s in light of what he called outdated practices, which I quote, if they had once made sense in a different cultural context, they do not today. And those things which are not essential Adapt them to the extent that you consider consistent with reason and well-ordered charity. The request of both Holy Fathers for renewal around the time of the Council 
does not seem to be directed toward tightening up what was lax, but toward overcoming an excessive burden of law. What does this tell us now here? I think it tells us that the destruction, destructive version of renewal of religious life that we witnessed after the Second Vatican Council had deep roots. If legalism and subjectivism have the same root, which is a false understanding of human freedom, it already existed before the Second Vatican Council. Let us not forget that some of the worst scandals of pedophilia in the church stemmed from events that came prior to the Council. I think that this recent history gives us reason to continue to reflect on how we see human freedom. For example, if the primary focus of formation is on conscience, or the central discussion about formation revolves around respecting conscience, we might still be struggling with anomalist understanding of man and God. Underneath it all, authority is being seen as a potential threat to personal conscience. Freedom is imagined to be the deepest ground of the human soul. In young religious women, a nominalist vision of freedom can look like ambivalence toward their vocations, a tendency to want to defend freedom at the cost of all commitments, the need to leave all doors wide open. Such women can tend to can tend to see commands and obedience as opposing them, which can manifest as mistrust or rage toward authority. Nominalist ideas of freedom can also look like scrupulosity or extreme guilt. They can look like anxiousness or a neurotic desire to uphold obligations and duties. A well-respected theologian in Rome recently told me that communities who don't understand freedom properly will not survive in the long run. So what is the right way to understand human freedom? The scriptural patristic tradition of the church does not understand human freedom as the ability to choose between opposite things indifferently. Nor does it understand God's law as an arbitrary restriction to human freedom. At first, the differences between a nominalist understanding of freedom and a traditional one may seem subtle, but the differences in where the emphases are put in the moral life as a result of the two perspectives of freedom are enormous. First, following scripture, the fathers of the church did not describe God as arbitrary in his freedom. For them, God is a trinity the Son who is the Word or the Logos, who proceeds from the Father. And from both the Word and the Father proceeds the Holy Spirit, the love of God. In other words, God's will is never separated from his truth. Saint Irenaeus or Saint Athanasius or Saint Augustine always had in mind that God is truth and goodness. They also believed that all of creation is ordered according to God's word. Man does not arbitrarily assign things their natures. Man grasps or understands God's designs and the, na and the natures God gave to different creatures. And man has a human nature. He is both rational and an animal as God made him. His rational and even his lower nature is oriented to God. Prior to making choices or exercising his freedom, man is naturally made to know and love God. Man most deeply longs for happiness, which is fulfilled only in God, the true good. Man's freedom, then, is not indifferent by nature, but it comes out of his capacity for reason truth, and goodness. Man cannot choose whether or not he ultimately longs for truth and goodness. He longs to be happy, and God alone makes him truly happy. 
Desire for truth and goodness is inscribed upon the heart of man. And it is out of this heart, determined to God, that he makes good choices and free choices. Freedom, then, is being able to choose what is truly good, what leads to God. And true freedom leads to happiness. This understanding of freedom needs to be developed, guided, and helped by grace. It is freedom for human excellence and fulfillment, not freedom to choose indifferently between opposite things. Grace and virtue perfect a man's freedom. Truth sets man free. Faith, hope, and charity, then, are the ultimate way to freedom as a participation in the inner life of God himself. What differences from nominalism are presupposed about man in the patristic scriptural view of freedom that I just described? I showed before that a nominalist understanding of freedom assumes that the intellect and will of men work separately. To repeat what I said before, first the human intellect learns the law, then it imposes the law on the will, then the person exercises his free will for the good or the bad. Were it not for the intellect, the will would otherwise be free to choose between opposite things. Recall also that the conscience serves as the guide and referee between the intellect and will. In the nominalist view of freedom, then, the intellect and the will can even appear to be in opposition to each other. From the traditional perspective on freedom, on the other hand, our intellect and will always work together harmoniously and simultaneously. The, orient, the orientation of our mind to truth and the orientation of our will to good things always works together. Actually, the human intellect and will operate similar, similarly to the possessions of the word and love in the Holy Trinity. In fact, this is what St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas understood when they said that man is in the image of God. Why is it significant that we understand the intellect and will to always act together simultaneously. If the intellect and will are a unit in us, our human freedom does not flow from the will alone, but from the intellect and the will. This means that we are equally attracted to truth and goodness. And in fact, what men seek most deeply corresponds both to the human capacity for truth in the intellect and the human drive for good in the will. Therefore, our freedom issues from our natural desire for what is both true and good simultaneously. And this is God. This means that our will is not indifferent to truth. And our intellect is not indifferent to spiritual affection. We desire truth as our good. In other words, our freedom is oriented naturally to God. This is why the patristic tradition can say that the human heart is restless until it rests in God. This means that before a man ever learns any laws, he is already naturally, interiorly desirous to do what is true and good. And let me repeat this because this is the key to the right understanding of freedom. Before any laws are written, man has a natural moral instinct to achieve the good he was created for. This instinct needs to be developed and perfected. Granted, sin obscures this interior instinct, but it still remains the way that man was created. Moral rules, then, if they're true moral rules, are the articulation of what a man is naturally inclined to do. From this more traditional view of freedom, a schema of moral action emerges that is very different from the nominalist one that I outlined earlier. To show what I mean, I'm going to make four comparisons. First, 
the overall goal of the moral life shifts from an emphasis on law in a nominalist ontic to an emphasis on achieving beatitude. Since the human capacity for freedom is given to us by God and fulfilled by knowing and loving God, instead of aiming to meet obligations, the Christian moral life aims at true happiness. Doing what is truly good is not a constraint upon the free will, but the fulfillment of our human nature, and it leads to our happiness. The freer we are to know and love God, the happier we are. Obviously, this requires the help of grace to achieve it. In the oldest traditions of morality, beatitude and not obligation is the measure and goal of our moral life. And please do not understand what I'm saying right now. I am not proposing that laws and duties disappear in a traditional idea of freedom. But it's a shift from a nominalist idea of freedom to a scriptural patristic one, which refocuses the goal of moral effort from keeping obligations to achieving true happiness. Law is seen as a stepping stone to growth in happiness, peace, and joy in Christ. Again, I'm not advocating relaxing our rules or our horariums. All the obligations that the church teaches are essential to religious life are very important, but they should not be confused with the goal of religious life, which is to exercise faith, hope, and charity, and to be perfected in the exercise of faith, hope, and charity, which is to become friends with God. What is the danger of fostering a morality based only on obligation? Let me give you just an example. If keeping the Ten Commandments or avoiding sin or keeping the rule becomes an end in itself, I can be satisfied as soon as I conform to the outward law. On the other hand, if knowing and loving God is what I seek in all the obligations that I keep, I seek growth without end. My striving in this life continues to deepen until my last breath. Our rules and the Ten Commandments are important because they are confirmed by the Church as conducive to developing the inner life of grace. With an outlook on human freedom more in keeping with the Gospel, for the Christian life, the moral code shifts from the Ten Commandments, primarily, to the Sermon on the Mount, or the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and say things falsely, say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Why would the Beatitudes take precedence in the Christian moral life based on a freedom for excellence? Because the Beatitudes describe an inner disposition that fosters true happiness and freedom in a man. They describe the way a man cooperates with the grace of Christ. The second shift of emphasis in the moral life following upon a better understanding of freedom is that human passions and natural inclinations are not viewed as a hindrance, but as the source and backbone of the moral life. This may sound surprising to us at first. Our natural desires written into our nature by God actually need to be fulfilled. Of course, I do not mean that every urge for food or comfort should be met. What is important, though, is to see that our inclinations, starting with the highest inclination of our intellect and will toward the true and good, are instilled in us by God and guide us to happiness. What I mean is that passions and inclinations are not to be deadened, but developed, integrated, and ordered. The work of formation, then, is not to foster a lack of desire in a young woman, 
but instead to intensify her desire for God. She can best love God if all her inclinations and affections fully alive are directed to and absorbed by the love of God and of the things of God, which includes the love of neighbor. To make an example, we often hear it said, we often hear holy indifference spoken of. Holy indifference should not be taken to mean encouraging a lack of desire and passion in a young woman. That would be a decidedly nominalist way of viewing natural inclinations, and I think it would do harm to a young woman. Instead, holy indifference should mean the withdrawal of affections from temporal things so as to intensify her desire for God. The third shift in a morality based on freedom for excellence is that the development of the virtue of prudence takes a central role in the moral life. And conscience takes on a supporting role, not a central role. Before I continue, I should say that the word virtue, when I say the word virtue, it can often be used today to mean one good act. This is an understanding of virtue in a nominalist sense. For example, when someone gives alms, we call that act virtuous. Or when someone on a diet resists a double chocolate brownie, we say, oh, aren't you virtuous? Virtue in a traditional sense does not refer to one good act. It is a disposition in the soul to act well all the time. Virtue is not found in one act. It is a maturation or a perfection of inner inclinations. The natural desires in us, especially for the good and the true, start off in a seed form. They require that we practice making good choices so that we are more and more able to do what is good. Virtues make doing the right thing easy, enjoyable, and even spontaneous in us. Based on this understanding of virtue, prudence is the virtue that rectifies our reasoning about what is good to do or to avoid. The prudent woman is not someone prudish, but someone with a habitual rectitude of reason and desire. We could also call her wise. Prudence develops our natural inclinations so that we are interiorly accustomed to recognize the truly good thing to do and to freely choose it in every situation. Just knowing what is the good thing to do is not prudence. I have to be able to carry through with the right thing to do. And not only to carry through with it, but to carry through with it with interior joy and peace and ease. The prudent person has developed her interior inclinations with the help of grace so that her powers of soul are readily at her disposal. She possesses herself so that she can use her gifts and, ta and talents with alacrity and creativity. She is not a slave to any compulsions. She has achieved self-mastery. Prudence understood in this way is the chief of the moral life. Conscience takes on the supporting role, allowing us to reflect on choices we have made so that we can make better and better ones. In this way, conscience helps us. It, conscience helps us to form prudence and other virtues. Formation built on a traditional view of freedom then focuses more on the interior development of prudence, which is actually the same as the development of interior freedom. Prudence is the virtue that makes us capable of freely and creatively choosing to do what is true and good. Notice that from this perspective on freedom, conscience is not imagined to be under constant threat of constraint or violation. The fourth shift in emphasis on a moral theory based on a more traditional view of freedom is that sin and evil are incorporated into a wider context than just failure in duties or obligations. Sin is not essentially doing what God said not to. It is choosing what is harmful to man, contrary to man's capacity to participate in God's own life. Sin makes man unhappy. God's laws are not laws only because he says so. Laws reflect what is inherently unnatural and noxious to man and contrary to charity. 
The more man can do what is truly good, the more fulfilled and happy he is, the more free he truly is. When he sins, he turns away from his own nature and ultimately turns away from the participation in God through faith, hope, and charity. Before making some suggestions about how we might inculcate a healthier view of human freedom in the young women we form, I would like to point out something true of all of our institutes. While we have here a wide variety of charisms and spiritualities, all of our congregations and orders are based on four basic rules. Recall that after the Franciscan rule, the Holy Father capped the possibility to create any new rules. As a result, all of our communities are based on rules written in the patristic age or in the early medieval period for the Franciscans. So at the foundation of all of our constitutions is a presupposed understanding of human freedom that is not compatible with nominalism. At the same time, all of the young women entering religious life today are coming to us out of a nominalist cultural context. And for that reason, it is nearly impossible that they are unscathed by its false sense of human freedom. How then would a formator teach or encourage a right perspective about human freedom in the young women she's forming? First, I think a minimal philosophical and theological formation in line with the biblical patristic tradition would be of great value. I'm not suggesting that all women in formation should earn degrees. Still, given the philosophical deformities rife in our culture today, it can be of inestimable help to a young woman to reflect on how she thinks of herself, the world, and God. We can help to remove obstacles to interior freedom just by helping a young woman to uncover false ideas and subsequent false reasoning that plagues her. Second, we the formators can model interior freedom by growing in true freedom ourselves. How we relate to authority, what we emphasize in our corrections and in our dialogue with young women we form, will all imply how we understand the relation between our obligations and our freedom. If we see every obligation of our life as oriented to the love of God and the deepening of our spousal union with him, this will be observed and imitated by those we form. What we want is for a young religious woman to see that every command of the superior becomes the opportunity not to give up her freedom, but to make an interior free choice to love God in faith. By growing in faith, hope, and charity, she imitates her divine spouse more each day. To conclude, I would simply like to reiterate that freedom is central to religious life and therefore to formation. God the Father initiates a call to religious life in a young woman, and he gives her the grace of Christ and the guidance of the Holy Spirit to follow her vocation. God gives the charism and the inner promptings of grace necessary for each young woman to fulfill her vowed life and to grow in holiness and happiness. The formator's role then is to recognize and respect God's work first and foremost, and then to guide a young sister to cooperate with him freely and creatively. Human freedom is the meeting point between God and the human soul. The more a formator can help a young woman to make truly good choices, the more she can grow in union with God. To guide those we form to cooperate freely with grace, we have to have an adequate understanding of human freedom ourselves. How we understand freedom will have an incalculable impact on how we live our lives as religious and form the next generation of women religious. Thank you for your kind attention. <laughs>